Okay, I'm just going to be, begin with a, a, a one minute karakia. Um, Lord, Lord, Father God, we submit ourselves to you. We, Jesus, we ask you to be Lord of this corridor. Holy Spirit, may we share what you want us to share. Uh, may you be glorified, Lord Jesus. And uh, may you get all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I'm just going to begin um, by um, just giving a bit of background into uh, the settlement of Canterbury. Um, I come from the Wairarapa myself and Rick is from England and we thought Christchurch was a, a lovely English looking city. Um, but a few years ago, we were commissioned as part of a group to look into the foundations of Christchurch city. Um, so we read up, um, a group of us read up on the archives at the museum from the Canterbury Association. And we were very surprised uh, to find um, about the vision for Christchurch. So I'll just fill you in two or three minutes from the Canterbury Association minutes. Um, so back in 1848, um, a group of um, evangelicals called the Evangelicals of, of Oxford College um, got together and were seeking the Lord. And um, they were asking the Lord uh, what he wanted them to do. They were interested in CMS mission work and uh, the Lord gave them a prophetic vision um, for the end times. And they believed that, that God wanted a city across the world to be a refuge from the coming darkness as um, darkness descended upon Europe in the future. Um, and so these, these particular group, um, two of them were sons of William Wilberforce, and uh, they declared that their life's purpose was the... Christ's great commission to go into all the world and to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of, and in the Holy Spirit. And even though they were Anglicans and um, Methodists, the High Anglican Church actually looked down on these evangelicals and they described them as being too enthusiastic and too focused on saving souls. <laughs> so that's a, that's a good way to be described. They valued holiness, faith, and a personal experience with the redeeming grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this was the original group. Now, as the, the pilgrims came over on, original pilgrims came over, 300 of them came on over on four boats. Others joined in, which included people who wanted to um, to. Uh, make money and build farms. Um, but a lot of money was raised by committed Christians who wanted to see a city for God. And so Rick's just going to read two extracts from the Canterbury Association minutes straight out of their words. Um, so the first one is that one, Rich. Sure. The Canterbury settlement appears likely to further the efforts already made to extend the blessed influence of the Redeemer's kingdom not only throughout New Zealand, but also in the surrounding islands of the Pacific Ocean. Austin Lee, who this, uh, this is who I'm quoting, saw the Canterbury settlement as a little leaven that would leaven the whole mass of the earth with the light and glory of the gospel of Christ. So when the first three ships arrived and landed at Littleton Port, uh, they got off the boat and they had a Thanksgiving service and the reading for the day as they got off the boat, and it lines up with the song you chose about bowing before him, because the reading for the day they read as they got off, the Canterbury pilgrims all read the scripture, Some Psalm 22. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations will bow down before him, for dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules the nations. So obviously other forces came into play once all the pilgrims arrived and um, the city was starting to be built. But it was great to know that's the foundations of Canterbury. So now we're going on to talk about um, unity in Christ. And there's a bit of a new reformation going on in the Anglican and Catholic churches at the moment. Um, so I uh, started off at the New Life Centre in the Wairampa. Um, so I'm a Pentecostal at heart. And in England, we were both going to the Vineyard Church. And so we've ended up both working for the Anglican Church to our surprise. <laughs> um, so we're going to begin with the, the Word of God. 
um, because that's a powerful weapon. So. so this reading is from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 3 to 6. Preserve the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So Psalm 133, which I probably don't even need to read to you, you'll probably know how good and pleasant it is when God's people dwell together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down the beard of Aaron, down onto the collar of his robe. It is like the dew of Hermon falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows a blessing, even life forevermore. And one more. Yeah. And this is from John 17, where Jesus is praying for the disciples. Verse 21, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Now, obviously, we all, we all want unity, which is based on biblical principles um, and not on uh, just uh, tradition or doctrine, but in fact on the Bible itself. So um, in 2017, the leaders of the Catholic Church were bishops, um, and the Lutheran Church signed a unifying document from conflict to communion. So the Protestants and Catholics at that time agreed on the gospel of Jesus Christ as laid out in the Holy Bible, the four gospels. And they also agreed on the founding document of the Nicene Creed, um, which we sing about the Hillsong song at the moment. Uh, one of them is the Creed, um, and it's all based on, on Bible teaching. So. Yeah, so this is a quote from the Salvation Army uh, booklet, Community Faith in Life 2016. Imagine a world where the thousands of Christian communities join together for one purpose, to proclaim Jesus Christ to the earth. Imagine the unstoppable force for good that such a united church could be. So Christchurch um, welcomed a new Catholic bishop last year in August of 2022, and in his first speech, he said, what, family, what father does not want um, unity in his family? Um, and he's been very welcoming of um, Christians from all denom denominations um, coming along to uh, the Catholic retreats and um, to the House of Prayer. Um, so, Rick, you're going to share about Cranes. Yeah. So I'm going to talk for a couple of minutes about uh, an initiative that uh, Joe and I have both uh, become involved with, which is called, it, it's called Cranes is the group. So that stands for Christian Renewal Aotearoa New Zealand. Uh, and it's basically a healing uh, ministry uh, for anyone who wants to receive emotional, physical, spiritual healing. and um, we, uh, I started getting involved with this with our previous vicar at, I worked for Sumner Redcliffe's Anglican, as, as Colin mentioned, and um, the previous uh, full-time vicar there, a guy called Thomas Brower and his wife, Cheryl, um, we were involved in some deliverance prayer for a few people in the church, and we very quickly realised that we were out of our depth, that we were really struggling. We uh, had a couple of sessions that lasted about four hours. We ended up exhausted. Uh, and just thought this, <laughs> we need to be trained up. We need um, more work for, um, from the Holy Spirit. And we also need um, more experienced mentors slash trainers. So we got involved with this with this group. Um, some of you who either live in Christchurch or not, may have heard of a, a retreat place called Replenish. Um, the three of us went out there to receive some training from a Catholic um, uh, vicar who is um, Mike... Mike Powell, who'd written a, a book which is um, about that very subject, about deliverance. So um, we found that training really good, and we signed up to be um, become members of CRAN. So basically, anyone who wants to be a prayer facilitator goes through a, a pretty structured training, 
session, you do a basic course um, twice and then an advanced course, and then you're uh, able to be a prayer facilitator. So we're, we're actually working um, across churches now. So there are Catholics and Anglicans. It doesn't need to be just Catholics and Anglicans, any church that wants to get involved in that. Um, but yeah, we we sometimes, if there's someone in our church who needs um, prayer, but would rather not pray with people that they already know, then I will contact uh, someone else and, and vice versa. Um, we've prayed for people from across town and, and so on. So that, that's been really uh, encouraging to uh, to work together with uh, other other denominations and just to see how God works. And that kind of built on Joe and I were both involved with uh, LL Ministries, which again is a healing ministry. We both received prayer from that. And, and again, the similar principle that the only criteria is that you believe in Christ and his resurrection and his power to heal. And then uh, you're trained as a facilitator and so on and you, you get involved. And the final group that I've been involved with of that type is is one called Healing Rooms that some of you may uh, have heard of that started in um, not Seattle, what's the place? Spokane in the uh, in America um, about 100, 120 years ago. And that's now a worldwide movement. So the group that I've been involved with until very recently was um, met at St Albans Baptist Church in Christchurch. And again, we we would turn up there, pray as a team, take communion together. And then anyone who wanted prayer would come. We'd wait on, on God to see what uh, God wanted to say to that person and then pray for healing. So those are some initiatives that, um, yeah, have been involved with across denominations mm -hmm. that uh, have really encouraged us, and it's been a joy to work with people from uh, other de other Christian denominations. Uh, so we've had about 20 people from our church who've done the Crans ministry training who um, do healing and deliverance too now, and uh, there's about 50 on uh, current members of the Crans team in Canterbury doing healing and deliverance ministry. And what made me laugh was we had uh, Catholic leaders teaching us the teachings and then they said we're using this, this book as well on deliverance and they held up a book by De Derek Prince on deliverance and we just thought that's quite funny um anyway I'll talk to you about 24 7 prayer so um that uh, we've been I've been involved with um and that this month we're celebrating 10 years of um a Catholic 24 7 prayer in North Canterbury so that's attached to St Gregory's Catholic Church it has a little chapel off to the side which would hold about 20 people and it's been open day and night uh, for 10 years during the lockdowns they put a camera in the room um, and uh, you put the link on your computer at home and you did your hour so people sign up to do one or two hours and there are people who who are on at two in the morning from two till three from three to four in the morning and um, they're pretty amazing um, and it, it's primarily in silence. Um, when you go there, other people are praying um, and they have uh, the showbread on the table in a metal case, which I thought was looked a bit strange, but uh, they said it re represents the living body of Christ on the altar, uh, like in the time of David, the priest had the bread on the altar. Um, and they have several versions of the Bible, including uh, Nicky Gumbel's Bible, um, the Alpha Bible is there, so you can spend time reading the Bible and praying, and you can write out your prayers on a piece of paper and just put them in a box at the um, at the altar if you find that helpful as well. Um, so I've been going there for about two and a half years and um, just meeting with Christ. They call it the Chapel of Adoration, um, but the the meaning is you go there to adore Christ. That is why you go, not just to ask, but to praise and worship Him. And um, so it's based on the teaching also of Mike Bickle, who's done a teaching on 24-7 prayer. And he um, bases that on the scripture from Amos 9 about in the last days. So I'll get Rick to read that scripture from Amos 9. In that day, I will rebuild the tabernacle of David and I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from long ago. Mm. So the tabernacle of David was prayer morning and night. 
um, and just worship to God, ministering to God, which is our highest calling, is to love the Lord with all our heart and minister to him. So um, one more scripture, um, and then we'll go on to talk about um, the prayer collective, Jesus. So Jesus said, my house shall be a house of prayer for all nations. And that's from Matthew 21, verse 13. Oh, one more thing that's that's come up for us, but also at Prayer Aotearoa um, conference in Wellington three weeks ago, was that God's house will be a house of prayer for every nation. And in Revelation 7, it talks about before the throne of God is represented every nation, every tribe, every tongue, and every language before the throne of, the, of God and before the Lamb. And um, so that word tribe, or nation is in the Greek ethnos, which means ethnicity. And uh, so there's a, a move to uh, raise up Māori and Pacifica um, leaders and worship leaders and uh, at the moment. And also um, the Anglican Church in 1995 passed a, a motion of the celebrating three tikanga uh, to do that um, in honouring the Treaty of Waitangi, raising up the um, Māori and Pacifica. So the three tikanga are tikanga Māori, tikanga Pacifica, and tikanga Pākehā. And together we make a strong rope, um, three-corded rope. And so we celebrated that yesterday in the Anglican Church all over New Zealand. Um, so now Rick's going to talk about the prayer collective. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll make this bit speedy because I've just seen the time and uh, Joe's going to say a little bit about prayer ministry. I know we need to be in groups oh, by 8.30. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. yeah sorry, what did I say? Yeah. Um, yeah, so Prayer Collective is a group set up by a couple, um, American couple called Kate and Noah Cremosino, who were attached to, well, still are attached to YWAM. But basically, um, they organised, and one of the things Joe and I like was a lot of young people were involved. So we were one of the oldest um there so it was great to see uh people in their teens and 20s and 30s coming together to to pray um through that they've been running the um prayer tent at easter camp for the last i think it must be at least five or six years for any of you who don't know easter camp is a huge um camp at easter time as you'd expect they um it's for high school um teenagers so basically years um whatever it is, years 9 to 13 now at school come together. And they in previous years, they've had as many as 5,000. After COVID, numbers are building up slowly. I think they're about 2,500 this year. But I really love being involved with that this year. They, um, it was wonderful to see they, the youth would come out from uh, the big top, which was the tent next there where they'd have had worship and a speaker. And then so many of them just lining up to receive either healing prayer or prophetic prayer or, or just wanting to... Uh, to be prayed for, to sit with someone. Um, that was wonderful. So uh, very excited about that. Right, I'll I'll hand over to Joe for a quick update on prison ministry. Right, okay. Oh, just to say the prayer collectives had these worship nights for every, oh, yeah. probably every one or two months, um, and they get about 120 people come and just worship together from all denominations. So prison ministry. So before the lockdowns, um, the Anglican Church, I was part of a team going out to Christchurch Men's Prison to do two services a month. And um, the chapel was full, mostly with gang members who'd been sent down from the North Island. So we'd have one service with um, mostly Black Power <laughs> members, and then they would separate them, have another group. There'd be quite a few from the mongrel mob. Um, and they would come to church, and they would love to sing and worship God. And uh, they would um, sometimes, the Holy Spirit was all over them, and sometimes they would cry, or they'd just get tears in their eyes and run down their faces and they would just say, oh, I just feel embarrassed because I know my nan's praying for me. Um, so they know about the praying grandmothers and uh, that God's answering. Quite a few of the guys in prison have asked uh, for Bibles in English and Māori because they say, I can learn Māori by reading the Bible. So they're learning the scriptures and also connecting with their own language. Um, so the Anglican Church has provided um, hundreds of Bibles for the young men in prisons. Um, so what else about that? We might be ready to go and pray. Um, oh, just to let you know, um, so the head of the, the gang, um, mongrel mob gang, uh, was really, really touched and gave his life to the Lord 
um, in 2019 from um, Hawke's Bay. So I'd love to know how he's getting on, but um, he was really overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit. It was quite embarrassing for him crying in front of a whole lot of young men. It was wonderful to see what God was doing. So um, at the moment, we're running a Freedom in Christ group for ex-offenders um, who've come out of prison, and uh, that's going quite well. That's a wonderful Bible study. So if we could pray for that prayer points, um, please pray that the prisons will open up again because, because of COVID and they're worried about the staff catching it. They've closed down um, these church services. So pray for that and pray for the Bible studies for the guys coming out of prison. Also for the gangs um, that they when they come out, they'll keep following Jesus and not go back to the gang life. Um, so that's a summary of what we've been doing. <laughs>